So how long to treat with blood thinners? And this would be blood thinners, be it warfarin, be it in the future Prodax or Xarelto. Um, this is how I summarize it in one slide. And if you look at the triangle, the top, the green, means low risk for future clots if the patient comes off warfarin, a blood thinners. The red large base means a high risk for blood clots. This patient with a high risk for clots, I would treat with long-term warfarin. And I would accept some risk for bleeding that everybody has with warfarin because you prevent a lot of blood clots. Whereas this patient who has a low risk for future clots, you would not keep on long-term warfarin because the risk for bleeding outweighs the benefit. And you see that the green area here, those patients typically get treated with three months of anticoagulation. And those would be patients with a DVT or PE due to a transient risk factor, i.e. surgery, major surgery, hospital stay, major trauma. Those people have a low risk for recurrence, three months for DVT or PE, stop, and we're good. Now, the people with the highest risk for recurrence, you see down here on the right, the men with either DVT or PE that is unprovoked, no risk factor identified, i.e. no hospitalization, no immobility. We call that an idiopathic DVT or PE, unprovoked. Those people, if they come off warfarin after, let's say, six months, have a one in three risk of another clot if they're not on warfarin over the next five years, a 30% risk of another clot. Clearly in that situation, we would keep a patient on long-term warfarin if the, tele if the patient tolerates warfarin well. Now, women have a slightly lower risk for blood clots, and therefore they fall here in, in the middle of this triangle. And particularly women who had a DVTRP that was hormone-associated with birth control pill, ring, or the patch, with pregnancy, hormone replacement therapy, they have a lowish risk for recurrence, even though not quite as low as the people with a surgery-associated clot. These people, one could make an argument for stopping warfarin, but there's some risk factors that predict a higher risk for recurrence in these women, such as overweight, such as old age, above 70. Um, and I'll get to some laboratory parameters, such as thrombophilias and the D-dimer. And then women with a true unprovoked event, an idiopathic DVT or PE, have this intermediate risk where if they tolerate warfarin well, we tend to continue warfarin long term, but there are certainly patients who do not like to be on warfarin, they have fluctuating INRs, they cannot get under control, they really want to come off warfarin. So these are these intermediate people where it would be nice to have some further risk assessment as to what their risk of recurrence truly is. And the additional risk factors I mentioned in women here in this category are obesity. The leftover clot, the scar tissue that I mentioned, is not a risk factor for recurrence, and that's why I put it into parenthesis, but I did want to mention it. So findings on the Doppler ultrasound do not really help with decision making. And then certainly we asked the patient about bleeding issues. Um, have there been major bleed? How about fluctuating INRs? Is it really painful to be on warfarin? Frequent visits to the clinic. Um, has there been an impact on your lifestyle? Have you given up hobbies, your physical or your profession? Has it impacted that? Military people on warfarin may have medical discharges, so it has huge implications. And then finally, patient preference clearly factors into this after discussion of the risk for recurrence. Now, obviously, this is a, a big topic here. Um, and you can read up more on this on the patient blog on clotconnect.org. Um, because I cannot really talk about all the different nuances of this. Uh, but I do want to mention that if we don't quite know what to do because of an intermediate risk for recurrence, and the patient would like to come off often, we can use a blood test, the D-dimer. And if it's negative, that's good, low risk for recurrence. If it's positive, higher risk for recurrence. Now, we do this on warfarin. If the D-dimer is negative, we take the patient off warfarin. Four weeks later, we repeat the D-dimer. If it's still negative, good, stay off warfarin. But if it turns positive, we restart warfarin with bridging with low metacord heparin because of a higher risk for recurrence. And then finally, 
if we still don't quite know what to do, we could certainly consider thrombophilia workup. And if there's a strong thrombophilia, that would suggest a higher risk for recurrence, and we might want to keep this patient on warfarin. And the strong thrombophilias are listed here, seven of them. Clear-cut antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, not the gray zone, slightly elevated titers, or levels of tests, but clearly, repeatedly positive tests. True antithrombin deficiency, rare. Protein C and protein S deficiency, uncommon. Homozygous factor V Leiden, this is having two abnormal factor V Leiden genes, uncommon. Having two abnormal prothrombin or factor II mutations, or having one abnormal five Leiden plus one abnormal prothrombin mutation. Those are the seven strong thrombophilias where I would think about long-term warfarin if the patient had an unprovoked clot. Now, the heterozygous state, only one abnormal gene leads to no significantly higher risk for future clots compared to people who don't have 5 Leiden. So the heterozygous 5 Leiden or heterozygous prothrombin mutation typically does not influence our management. But I can tell you there's no consensus who really should be tested or not, but increasingly in the last few years we've tested less and less because often we can make clinical decisions on length of warfarin just based on was it an unprovoked clot or not, is it a man or woman, the age, the obesity, maybe the D-dimer that I mentioned. So more details can be found on the Clot Connect patient blog. One thing I wanted to mention, people who have an unexplained clot may wonder why they clot it. And if we do a thrombophilia workup, only half of the people will be found to have a thrombophilia, a clotting disorder. The other 50, we don't find anything. And we just need to accept that as a fact. It's our limited knowledge in 2011. Eventually, we will discover more reasons why people clot, but often, at this time, we don't find a reason. Certainly, some percentage of patients with DVT or PE will be diagnosed with a cancer in the first six, maybe 12 months after an acute clot was found, the DVT or PE, and thus the clinician really needs to take a good history, good physical exams, some basic labs, um, make sure the patient's up to date with screening tests to make sure we don't miss the cancer. So these are the thrombophilias I do test when I think about thrombophilia testing, and I'm looking for a strong thrombophilia. The fact that I have light mutation to discover the homozygous state, the fact that two mutation, protein C, protein S, antithrombin activities, and then the three antiphospholipid antibodies called lupus anticoagulant, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, and the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies. And they need to be repeatedly positive at least three months apart and clearly positive before one labels a patient as having APLA syndrome or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Homocysteine can be tested for and is a marker of an increased risk, but lowering homocysteine levels with folic acid, B6, B12, does not change the risk for future clots. So I've more or less given up on testing for homocysteine and I clearly do not lower it anymore with B6, B12 and folic acid if the level is elevated because lowering does not make a difference to the risk of clots. I do not test for the MTHFR genetic test. It's not, it's not a thrombophilia in the U.S. where food is supplemented with folic acid. No use testing. Factor 8 levels, no use testing. It's a risk factor for a first clot, yes, but it does not predict recurrence and is therefore not helpful in deciding how long to treat with warfarin. Uh, and then clearly I do not test for PI-1 levels or genetic tests or TPA uh, levels or genetic tests because the data and literature are very discrepant. We don't know whether they are risk factors for clots and we cannot base any clinical decisions on uh, these tests. Testing of other family members. So if a patient with DVTP is found to have antithrombin deficiency or factor V Leiden, some testing of other family members may be appropriate, particularly female family members, because they want to make a choice on birth control options that are safe, on pregnancy management. Um, the details are listed again on clotconnect.org in the patient blog. Um, it would go too far to mention that in detail here. 